All right, let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the National Collaborative on Childhood Obesity Research's Connect and Explore webinar. My name is Rudy Karnick, and I'm excited to host today's webinar. Today's spotlight is introducing a guide to methods for assessing childhood obesity. Before we begin, please note all attendees are muted. For today's spotlight, our presenters will walk you through NCORE's latest resource, a guide to methods for assessing childhood obesity. Following the walkthrough, we will have some one-on-one -on -one Q and A time with the author of the guide and the NCORE work group chairs, co-chairs. And finally, we will close with NCORE announcements. Today we are joined by Dr. Dimpna Gallagher, Professor of Nutritional Medicine at the Columbia University Medical Center, who authored this user guide. We are also joined by two members from NCORE who co-chaired the development of this user guide. We have Dr. Vula Osganian from the National Institutes of Health and Dr. Brooke Belay from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Drs. Osganian and Gallagher will walk us through the guide and its development. Following the presentation, all three presenters will be available to answer any questions regarding the new user guide. If you have a question for our speakers during the webinar, please write it in the chat box on the right side of your screen. If you need technical assistance, please let us know using the chat box. If you're having trouble logging into the webinar, please email us at ncore at fhi360.org and we'll work with you to resolve the problem. We'll also be live tweeting during the webinar. So if you're on Twitter, we encourage you to join the conversation by using the hashtag ConnectExplore and following at Encore on Twitter. To start things off, we'd like to open up with a brief poll. You can submit your answer directly on the screen. The question today is, prior to today's webinar, were you aware of a guide to methods for assessing childhood obesity? Please select yes or no. All right, thank you so much for answering that poll. It seems like about three quarters of you have not heard of it and another quarter of you have. So glad to see everyone joining us, uh, whether or not you have, there's a lot to learn today. And next I'm going to pass it over to Vula who will open up our spotlight with some background on NCORE's latest user guide. Vula, take it away. Great, thank you. You can hear me well? Yes, we can hear you, thank you. Great, so a key priority for NCORE is promoting the use of common measures and methods across childhood obesity prevention research and evaluation efforts. And so the use of these standardized or common methods are needed to really reliably evaluate interventions designed to prevent childhood obesity or excess body fat in children. So as part of this effort to develop a guide, we really wanted to promote not just common methods, but those that are most reliable and feasible. So however, NCORE recognizes that it can be really challenging for users to choose the most appropriate methods to assess adiposity or the amount of body fat in children. And NCORE also learned that students, researchers, public health practitioners, clinicians, and really related professionals who have an interest in studying weight-related outcomes often really struggled to comb through what was an abundance of information to select the most appropriate method to assess adiposity in research and evaluation. And so to address this need, NCORE developed this guide to describe six of the most common methods used to measure adiposity and also develop case studies that walk users through the process of selecting and using the various um, adiposity assessment methods. And then in addition, I think as you can see from this figure, there are really numerous adverse health outcomes shown to be associated with obesity in children, which also really provides strong support for the potential value of measuring adiposity and intervening early in children. So earlier this year, NCORE 
released the new user guide, a guide to methods for assessing uh, childhood obesity. You can find the guide in both HTML and PDF formats uh, on the site listed on this slide. So this next slide, uh, we're just going to highlight the sections that you'll find in the guide. So as a user reads through the guide, they're going to learn about the importance of assessing childhood adiposity, the factors that influence it, and the clinical utility of assessing it. Uh, the section on assessing adiposity will walk the users through the use of each method along with its strengths and limitations. And then the section on case studies um, shares six real-world examples of assessing adiposity in a variety of settings and has the user think about the key considerations for selecting a method in each of those um, settings. Then throughout the guide, there are going to be links to resources that will allow the users to access additional detailed information really at your fingertips. And these are also included in the resources section at the end of the guide, along with a brief description of each particular resource. And then finally, every, all the information that are on the slides was pulled from the user guide, so you can find any specific details and references of that information uh, in the guide. Uh, the guide covers the, method, the methods shown on this slide, um, anthropometry which includes length, stature, weight, skin folds, and waist circumference, bioelectrical impedance analysis, air displacement uh, plethysmography, and dual um, energy X-ray absorptiometry, or DEXA. Uh, they're presented in the order that are seen here, which is essentially how they fall on the feasibility validity continuum. And then um, all of these methods estimate adiposity through various means or approaches that are uh, explained in detail in the guide. And so I'm going to turn it over to Dipna, who's going to highlight um, the various sections that you'll hear about in the guide in, in more detail. Thank you, Vula, and good afternoon, everyone. So what is body composition? So to understand the assessment of adiposity, we first need to start with body composition and what it is. Body weight, as measured on a scale, is essentially the sum of fat mass and fat-free mass. Body composition is the relative proportion of fat mass and fat-free mass in the body. Fat mass is made up of adipocytes, or fat cells, in adipose tissue, in addition to fat deposits that are found in various other cells and organs of the body. Fat-free mass consists of muscle, bone, and internal organs, as well as body water compartments. Next slide. So how to measure body composition? Well, simple, accessible, and accurate methods for measuring body fat mass directly in human beings or living individuals are not available because use of such direct measurement methods would harm a person. For these reasons, researchers and practitioners use indirect and surrogate measures to estimate body fat mass in living persons. Indirect measures are based on the premise that established relationships exist between specific body components. Next slide. So what influences body composition? Well, body composition ch changes as children grow and mature. Many factors influence these changes, including hormonal, environmental, and disease processes. Growth is associated with increases in fat-free mass, increases in fat mass, and changes in the relative proportions of these body components have important implications for the accurate measurements of body composition. The timing and distribution of changes in fat mass also has important implications for current and importantly, future health, including the risk of developing adult obesity and various metabolic complications, such as insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, abnormal blood lipids. These topics are presented in greater detail in the guide. Next slide, please. So what should I know when assessing adiposity? Well, various measurement methods may be used to assess body composition and specifically adiposity when conducting research and evaluation in clinical and field-based settings. 
These methods vary in reliability, validity, participant acceptability, cost, and technical complexity. Each method has advantages and disadvantages and some degree of error that relates to the underlying assumptions in the estimate of body fat, as well as error due to the actual measurements referred to as measurement error. Next slide. What matters when choosing a body composition measurement method? Well, the choice um, depends on the goal of the study or the evaluation, the type of tissue to be assessed, the study population being investigated, and the setting and resources available. Next slide. Specific factors to consider when selecting a me measurement method include validity of method in es estimating body fat, the reliability, the sensitivity to measurement of change in fat over time or with an intervention, the ability to predict health risks or outcomes, availability of reference ranges or norms for the study population, accessibility of the tool, accessibility of the tools and or the equipment, and availability of staff in terms of training and level of skill needed, cost and degree of burden and or risk and acceptability to the participant. So what is the ideal method? The ideal method then has high validity, high reliability, low cost, low participant risk, and low burden. However, what is ideal does not work in practice. Methods that have high validity often lack feasibility, and methods that are more feasible are frequently less valid. In the following slides, I will present the methods in order of most feasible and often least valid to least feasible and often most valid in population-based studies. Next slide. So anthropometry. Anthropometry is the study of human body measurements that provide information on body size and dimensions. Anthropometry is composed of physical measurements that include recumbent length for very small children who, that cannot stand, or stature for children who can stand, weight, and regional dimensions, including circumference measurements and skin full thicknesses. Next slide. Length and stature and body weight. Um, recumbent length, stature and weight are the most common measurements used to assess weight status and monitoring of growth. They're often used to calculate indices that can be used to define obesity across all ages from infancy um, through adulthood. Next slide. Body mass index, BMI, is calculated from weight and height as weight per height squared and is expressed in kilograms per meter squared. BMI or body mass index is a common index used to assess weight status and define obesity among adults and children aged two years and older. Although BMI does not measure body fat, it is highly correlated with total body fat at higher levels, and thus values above a specific cut point are used to define obesity or excess adiposity. Next slide. The advantages of length, stature, and weight include simple, quick measurements to acquire, non-invasive and safe measurements, highly acceptable to participants, inexpensive portable equipment, minimal staff training required. Disadvantages include does not measure body fat, provides only an indicator of weight and obesity status. Next slide. Skinful thicknesses. Skinful thicknesses are measured using calibers to assess the thickness of the subcutaneous fat layer. Because the subcutaneous fat layer varies in thickness across the body, measuring sites at different anatomical locations of the body can assess upper and lower body fat distribution. Skin full thicknesses can be used across all ages, from infancy through adulthood. And here on this slide, some of the locations uh, of where we measure skin full thicknesses, um, tricep, bicep, uh, on the trunk region, subscapular, um, 
are shown. Next slide. The advantages include simple and quick measurement, a non-invasive and safe measurements, acceptable to participants, and expensive and portable equipment. Disadvantages include training and skill required, privacy is needed, um, child compliance is required to some extent, they need to be comfortable with the technician touching them, measures only the subcutaneous fat thickness, and predictive equations are required to estimate total body fat. Next slide. Circumference measurements provide measurements that assess body size or dimensions of the specific region of the body that is measured. Here, so waist circumference or abdominal circumference provides information on central body fat distribution. It is generally conducted on individuals who are older than eight years of age. There are several different sites noted in the literature uh, and therefore when measuring waist circumference it's important to be consistent so that the same anatomical location is measured in any one specific study. Next slide. The advantages include, include relatively simple and quick measurements, non-invasive and safe measurements, moderately acceptable to participants, and expensive and portable equipment. Disadvantages include training and skill required, privacy is needed, source of embarrassment on occasions during the measurement to the participant, includes both abdominal, visceral, and subcutaneous adipose tissue. Difficult to measure consistently over time and on participants with obesity. Next slide. Bioelectrical impedance analysis or BIA method estimates fat mass and fat free mass by measuring the resistance of a small low voltage electrical current as it travels through water in the body's tissues. From this prediction equations estimate total fat mass and fat free mass. It may be used across all ages from birth through adulthood. There are multiple different bioelectrical impedance analysis instruments out there. Next slide. The advantages include relatively simple and quick measurements, non-invasive and safe measurements, moderate to high acceptability to participants, relatively inexpensive and portable equipment. Disadvantages include participant preparation required, child compliance is required, growth in children may violate key assumptions in using BIA on their specific predictive equations are incorporated. Next slide. Air displacement plethysmography, ADP um, method uses the volume of air displaced by a participant in a sealed testing chamber to measure the participant's body volume and to estimate body density. Predictive equations are then used to estimate values for total fat mass and fat free mass. The ADP technique can be used to measure infants beginning at birth through approximately six months, weighing up to a maximum weight of eight kilograms. And this is in an instrument called the peapod. And it can also be used to measure individuals ages six years and older and weighing between 35 and 200 kilograms in an instrument called the bog pod. However, there is a pediatric adapter um, available for testing young children between the ages of two and five. Advantages include relatively short duration to conduct tests, non-invasive and safe measurement, moderate to high acceptability to participants. The disadvantages include staff training and skill is required. Um, privacy is needed, source of embarrassment for children during measurement as minimal tight fitting underwear or bathing suit is required. Equipment is expensive and it's not portable, participant preparation is required, and child compliance is required. Next slide. Dual energy X-ray absorptiometry, or DEXA, method uses two low-dose X-ray beams and instrument-specific algorithms to estimate body, total body, and regional estimates of body components, including bone mineral content, bone-free fat-free mass, and fat mass. This method can be used across all ages from infancy through adulthood. The advantages of DEXA include relatively short duration to conduct the test, non-invasive and safe measurements, moderate acceptability to participants. The disadvantages include skilled and certified technicians are required, privacy is needed, 
Equipment is expensive and not portable. Child compliance requires young children must be restrained. Low dose ionizing radiation is exposure is involved. Um, manufacture instrument specific algorithms are required. So next slide. So case studies. The user guide includes six cases, each designed to highlight considerations for population health research. They illustrate how these considerations inform the selection of the most appropriate method or methods for a given scenario based on the research aim or question. The study design, the setting, while taking into consideration various pros and cons of different measurement methods that are relevant to the study. The case studies take different scenarios to help users in terms of what to think about when working with a specific population and within a specific setting. On the following slide, I will walk you through the case study, the effect of maternal gestational weight gain on newborn adiposity, but I hope that you will review the others as many of them may be relevant to your work. The other case studies here on this slide are school-based clustered randomized controlled trials to prevent childhood adiposity, assessing adiposity in infancy to predict risk of developing overweight and obesity, assessing adiposity changes in a community-based healthy weight program, assessing, analyzing and presenting health data from electronic health records, and a clinic-based intervention to promote weight loss in adolescents and with severe obesity. So next um, slide. So several clinical researchers are now designing a randomized controlled trial to evaluate whether counseling women with overweight and obesity to eat a healthy diet and maintain an appropriate level of physical activity during pregnancy will affect infant adiposity measures at birth. Preventing excessive gestational weight gain in women may lead to a healthier body composition in the offspring at, at birth. Healthier meaning less fat mass and greater fat free mass. That's the hypothesis. The study aims to determine whether the intervention delivered to women during pregnancy when the fetus is developing has a measurable effect on offspring body composition at birth. Next slide. The researchers are aware that most births will take place in hospitals and there's a limited time window, approximately one to three days in which they can measure most infants before the mother is discharged. Conducting the study in the hospital ensures privacy. Additionally, length, weight and head circumference measurements are taken routinely after birth to assess overall newborn health. Acceptability of the measurements to parents who will provide consent is often high. The researchers will be only required to measure body composition of the newborn one time before the mother and newborn are discharged from the hospital following birth, which eliminates the need for a method that is sensitive to changes over time. However, the method or methods to be used need to be sufficiently sensitive to detect small differences in fat mass and fat-free mass between the intervention group and the usual care. Next slide. Many methods could be used in the study depending on the resources available to the research team, as well as parental preferences and concerns. Length and weight are the most commonly, common measurements taken as they are the least intrusive, generally require little skill, training and equipment, and can be, ducted, can be conducted quickly with minimal costs. However, length and weight and the relative indices such as weight for length and weight for age percentiles do not provide information on body composition, specifically fat mass or fat-free mass. Such indices assume that a higher percentile reflects additionally, additional or excess fat mass and fail to consider the contribution of the fat-free mass compartment to weight. The study team finds this to be potentially problematic because a higher index could reflect greater lean mass rather than fat mass. The team considers other potential methods to more specifically assess total body fat. Skinful thicknesses of the triceps, subscapular and iliac crest can be used to assess between group differences in subcutaneous fat, which is a proxy for total body fat. Methods that have been validated to measure whole body fat mass and fat-free mass with high precision in the newborn include air displacement plethysmography, 
Peapod and Dexer. Um, so in this slide here, we indicate um, ADP and DEXA have been validated to measure whole body fat mass and fat-free mass with high precision in the newborn. May be available in the hospital setting, but costly. Required data collected collect during the, the individuals collecting the data to have skill and training. Required that the infant be as still as possible during testing. So all methods have pros and cons, which the team must consider. Next slide. Ultimately, the study team decides to use DEXA for the primary outcome as it is available in the study and can more precisely use, assess fat mass and bone-free lean mass. The study will also measure length and weight and use their, these indices, weight for length and weight for age, as a secondary outcome, as these measures are commonly used in clinical practice to assess growth and commonly used in other studies for comparison. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dimpna. And now it's time for our Q&A. So feel free to throw your questions into the chat box. I see we have one question so far. Um, could someone comment on hydrostatic weighing, particularly for use with older children and teens? So hydrostatic weighing is, er, is uh, similar in principle to air displacement. Uh, however, it's water displacement rather than air displacement. Um, it is a standard, uh, standard method, has been validated and was one of the original. Um, in terms of advantages, disadvantages, um, it is less used today because of the uh, burden it places on individuals to actually require them to be totally submerged underwater while exhaling maximal air out of their lungs. So for that reason, um, in terms of equipment needed and the amount of burden, it is rarely used today given that these other methods are more readily available. It is a valid method, just like air displacement is a valid method if it is conducted um, properly, the technician is well trained and the right instructions are given to the participant so that the participant can adhere. Great, thank you for that. Another question we have is, someone is wondering if there has been consideration as to how the child or youth feels when being measured in these different ways. Um, so for example, how a child might feel um, high levels of shame, importance of measuring in private, uh, dealing with negative parent comments, impacts on body esteem, measurement sensitivity training, et cetera, if you could speak on that. Um, so can you just give me one part of that question first so that I'm clear about what I'm being asked? Um, if you could speak to how the child or youth might feel when being measured in different ways, and I know Amanda, you might be able to answer this as well, so feel free to chime in afterwards. So I, I may just take um, a stab at answering it. I think typically we rarely are using all of these methods in any one study. Um, so therefore, we select a method in part based on the age of the child, uh, the suitability of that measurement method to that given age, and based on what parents uh, are prepared and willing to do. Any measure that feels uncomfortable um, a child is not going to agree, or especially if they need to cooperate. Um, however, much depends on the research team or the clinicians and their ability to engage the child and make them feel comfortable because it's not meant to be on an uncomfortable experience. Thank you so much. Amanda from at our NCOR Coordinating Center, did you have anything to add? All right, yeah, well, thank you for the confusion. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, and these are great questions, so please feel free to keep them coming. Um, can BIA be used with pregnant women? Or if not, which tool would be the most useful with this population? So the question is related to 
which, sorry, I, I'm not hearing you well. No worries. Which tool would be the most useful for the, for pregnant women, that population? Okay, that's a very good question. So in terms of measuring body composition in pregnancy, um, most of these techniques um, are valid because the underlying assumptions um, are violated during pregnancy. So to assess actually fat distribution changes or total body fat, there are very few, if any, measure, me measurement method available. We have most recently used whole body MRI um, beginning at the, at the beginning of the second trimester of pregnancy. Um, and then at the end of pregnancy to on, try to understand how women uh, body composition changes and where that change is occurring. Great, thank you so much. Um, is there data to understand how parents react to the various methods as far as giving consent? Yes. Um, so are there data I cannot cite actual studies myself. I can talk about my own um, almost 30 years of experience conducting these studies. Um, at the time of screening and over the phone and at the time of recruitment, um, it is very important to be very clear about what the study involves. Um, sharing the consent form with the parent before they even make a commitment so that they can read what's involved, they can get an opportunity to answer any question and sharing with them potential past studies that have been published where that particular measurement method um, has been used. Parents are more concerned about, for example, some parents' DEXA because there's a small amount of radiation involved, whereas other parents understand that the amount of radiation is like equivalent to the background radiation if you fly from New York to LA. Um, However, that's an example of where parents may say, no, a study involving DEXA I would not be comfortable with, whereas a study involving PPOD or BODPOD, I would be. Great, thank you. Um, our next question, and Vula or Brooke, feel free to chime in as well. Which measure is recommended for clinical use as opposed to research use? You can go ahead, Vula. So this is Vula. So I don't know if there's such a hard distinction. Um, I think in clinical practice, we've used DEXA, um, ADP, the, the, the BOD pod, we've used BMI. So I think they have pretty much all uh, been used in both. Again, it depends on feasibility, um, cost, and the purpose, you know, the clinical as well as the research purpose. But, and we've used BIA too. So I think, you know, I think they can be somewhat used in both depending on uh, the purpose and, and availability. And, and this is broken. I, I completely agree, of course. Um, and to add to Lulu's co comment on um, purpose, the purpose is partially determined by um, not just what the uh, clinician needs the data for, um, but the sort of where they are. Um, so uh, for the vast majority of, of primary care, you know, the um, assessment methodology they use might be very different from um, uh, those, those clinicians who perhaps are in specialty fields or are more closely linked with um, a large tertiary care center um, and they have access to um, some, some resources and so forth. Great, thank you. Another question, are there references for body fat from BIA for children? And at what age do you need to adjust for sex, like male or female, in body fat analyses? And whoever wants to take this, feel free. So I can tell you that there are body fat differences um, between sex um, at birth. So when children are born, girls, females already have greater body fat 
than males. So when talking about adjusting, it's already there at birth. Um, so the second question was about BIA. I would say to anyone, there are multiple BIA instruments that are available. It is important to review um, the background studies that were conducted from which the data were used to develop the algorithms that have been built into that BIA machine. Because if it's the BIA data were collected in a population living in New York City, then and the, you are living in the Netherlands and you want to use that instrument, it may be that there is a source of error associated with the underlying population in terms of how translatable are the data collected in New York to the Netherlands. So there's no one simple answer to your question. And I think we address that to some extent in the guide. Thank you. What method is recommended for children with development coordination disorder or any children with mental and physical disorders? Again, Vula, Brooke, Dimpa, anyone who'd like to take this. So I think you, the techniques that require least um, maybe um, involvement on the part of the participant, um, if I'm understanding the question correctly, would be um, more accurate. So for example, DEXA. DEXA requires uh, a person to lie on this, the DEXA bed or stretcher for um, a short period of time. That could be five minutes, eight minutes, but they need to be able to lie there and not move. Yeah, and I would just add um, that would probably be a guide in itself, um, and that we did not cover that in detail in the in our guide in this guide. But that there is literature that exists on um, you know what types of methods would be more appropriate for different conditions so, or, or disabilities. So I think uh, I think you could look in the literature and find more on that topic. Thank you. So we sort of touched on a different angle of this earlier, but are there any data or strategies recommended about how the researcher can support mental health, such as the self-esteem, self-compassion, feelings of guilt and shame of children and teens when they undergo measurement of adiposity when using these tools? Oh dear, I need to hear that again. Can you just repeat that? No worries. Are there any data or strategies recommended about how the researcher can support mental health of children and teens when they undergo measurement of adiposity when using these tools? So I would just make the comment that um, what's, when you're measuring body composition, you're measuring adiposity, but you're also measuring more than just the adiposity. And I think the important component is to say that um, it's, it's not just focused on fat. It's trying to understand um, what your body composition is. That includes fat and fat-free mass to, and to try to determine um, whether there's an, a reason for, let's say, a teenager to want to make some modifications to become um, engage in a healthier exercise. And I think that's important. It's not focusing in on image or shape. Um, Villa, I pass that over to you. Are you passing that to me, Dipna? I'm not yeah. hearing well for some reason. Yes. Yeah, I don't, you know, I'm not aware of any special um, you know, studies or data on it. But I would say we certainly, when we do research on children, um, we, you know, as clinicians, we have to be sensitive to uh, the child's feelings and we're trained in that way 
And we certainly would never force any child to do any measurement that they're uncomfortable with. They can refuse at any moment. Um, so again, it's, it's sort of a, a sensitivity that I think and a training that you undergo when you work with children in general, as well as when you're doing adiposity measurement. Um, and this is Brooke. I, um, I was thinking that you know, when, when, when we had these discussions with, with children and their families and we're about to undergo these or, or, or ask them to undergo these um, investigations, um, th this is a general comment, but I think it's very applicable. You know, we uh, have to relate to the uh, child and the individual and the family, as, as Rula was mentioning. And, and part of that has to do with identifying them as, as a per person. So, you know, people first language and speaking about, um, as Dipna mentioned, uh, you know, trying to understand the, their body composition, uh, trying to understand, you know, if there are any reasons for um, perhaps something uh, occurring, um, identifying the disease and separating that from the person. So you talk about uh, individuals with obesity, you know, um, have a conversation um, and, and tell a child or, or tell a, a parent that the child is obese, um, the child has obesity. So I, I think um, having that sort of framework overall helps with um, a lot of the stigmatization and, and, and depression that um, uh, as a profession, we might unintentionally burden families with. Thank you. On a related note, what if the patient and, or parent are unwilling to allow any of these methods? So from a clinical, from a research participation, then they would not be enrolled in the study. Um, clinically, um, I think then a clinician can use the weight and height based uh, index or measure to try to interpret whether um, the child is a such normal weight or if there's a reason for them to parent to be aware that they may want to help the child to get to a healthier weight. Thank you. And we have one more question here. Are you aware of any new methods being developed to try and optimize the feasibility or reliability trade-off? Or are there any new developments emerging with these existing techniques that you're aware of? So that's in terms of um, the trade-off. I think this is one of the reasons why the guide uh, was required or was identified is that there is no one single method that um, we can check the box for validity, reliability, acceptability. Um, so this is an ongoing effort and discussion. There are always efforts ongoing, for example, bioelectrical impedance analysis. There have been tremendous um, advances in the last five plus years with the um, availability now of multi-segmental, multi-frequency BIA instruments. That's a move forward from the single frequency. And BIA, as an example, may in fact become a technique, uh, but a lot more studies need to be done in different populations. So as yet, I would say um, we're not there yet. All right, thank you so much. Thank you to everyone for those great questions. Um, as a reminder, if you have more questions, you can always reach out to us. Um, and many of the questions will be answered in the guide itself. So be sure to check that out. And before we let you go, if we could go to the next slide, thank you. We just have some Encore and events and announcements. So for upcoming events, Encore is presenting a poster at APHA. Um, we'll be presenting on measures for children at high risk for obesity, choosing whether to apply, adapt, or develop a measure for your research population. So be sure to check that out if you're attending APHA. We'll also have a poster on this user guide at Obesity Week um, on assessing childhood obesity. That will be available um, online from November 2nd to December 31st. More announcements. We've recently published um, 
a supplement in childhood obesity about the childhood obesity evidence base, COEB, um, a test of a novel taxonomic meta-analytic method. You can find that on our website, ncore.org slash COEB. That will include four papers and two commentaries, so be sure to check that out. If you are a graduate student or faculty member and you haven't signed up for our NCORE Student Hub, be sure to do that as well. It's a quarterly e-newsletter that goes out with all of the latest information about NCORE resources, events, um, and everything you need to know to stay up to date in the field. Here's a sneak preview of our Student Hub webpage. You can find that on our website. And if you've used any of NCORE's tools, let us know at NCORE at FHI360.org and we may feature you in our next webinar. Any other questions about anything from the webinar today or upcoming activities, please email us at NCORE at FHI360.org. You'll be able to find this webinar and all of our previous webinars on our website as well in our archive. So you can head to their, our website to jog your memory on anything that you heard here today or anything that you might have missed in the past. Thank you so much to everyone who attended and to all of our wonderful speakers today. We hope you enjoy learning more about the user guide and will be able to find it useful in your upcoming research or other work that you're doing. Thanks everyone, have a great day.